join me please in welcoming John Pulley, whose work you can see behind him. It's an honor to have John here. His practice has started many years ago in the late 80s, and he's not only an accomplished painter and drawer, as you can see, but he's also an acclaimed writer and widely published. And he's going to tell us a little bit more about his work. So join me in welcoming him. Thank you. OK, part two. <laughs> um, uh, I was actually hoping you would all go and a fresh group would come. So, so I can repeat the whole story again. <laughs> You're fresh, fresh. Okay, who's fresh? Oh, a lot of fresh people. Fresh off the boat. <laughs> okay, um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to kind of uh, uh, repeat myself, but, um, you know, one of the things, you know, when I'm kind of, uh, you know, doing art is, or whatever, um, when, when I'm in the process of doing it is and, 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 and kind of getting ready to exhibit it. Um, it's quite a, um, you know, qu quite a fantastic kind of thing, you know, to, to kind of sit there and wonder, you know, about, you know, all the, um, you know, why I write. I mean, when I started, I'll talk about why, why, I, why I write, actually. And when I started writing, I started writing in 1980 when I was 18, uh, years old, but um, but a year before that, I was working in. Uh, by this time, I was working in the factories, and I and I just suddenly just realised I didn't want to um, work in a factory anymore. So at 17 years old, um, I was um, living with a big extended family out in South Auckland in Otara. We were living in a two a very you know two-story state house, um, which became you know um, associated and synonymous with a lot of low-income earning families and a lot of Pacific Island families. Um, and Otara was supposed to be a model of uh, cleanliness and, and hope for the Labour Party, at the t Labour government at the time. Um, but it quickly turned into, um, you know, derelict, um, kind of run down, backward, you know, um, little suburbs where people um, kind of avoided it, and we used to joke that you know you would need a passport <laughs> to come into our part of town. So, um, but um, I learned how to. I first learned how to write when I was living in the state house. Um, I told the story the other day, um, somewhere around here, where I was reading the TV guide and I saw these words strangely arranged in this little box, sitting in the middle of this page with all these, you know, text around it. And, and what fascinated me ab about it was the way they were kind of arranged, you know, it was like, they were like building blocks. And when I tried to read it, I couldn't understand it. Um, but I could understand the words each as, as a, a single entity, but I couldn't kind of um, figure out what the whole, what, what the poem was trying to, to kind of tell me. I uh, found out later that it was called a poem and the person who wrote it was called a poet and I was hooked. I was fascinated with these uh, words and so I started writing. Um, my background in education is, was pretty piss poor, was pretty poor. I, was, I got expelled at 14 and I was probably at the bottom. I was one of the, considered to be one of the, you know, um, unenthusiastic you know, pupils in the class, um, you know, who really didn't give a damn about um, trying to place um, speech patterns, you know, in the paragraphs. The teachers were spending hours with his back to us writing on the blackboard. Um, so, when I f so when I first started uh, writing, I, I had to almost guess how to use the English grammar and how, where am I going to place you know, all these things are important to us as um, readers. Um, so right through the 1980s, I, I basically just just wrote. I didn't care. I didn't have an understanding of it. I just wrote all my um, feelings down. And when I first started um, to, to read in public, I realized I, you know, to, to save myself embarrassment of standing up there and, you know, can't do my thing. I used to get friends of mine to edit my poems. So um, friends would edit it for me and then I'll go up on stage and then I would start 
<coughs> reading it. <coughs> in 1990, um, I took on the, um, this really ambitious project and I wrote a novel. And the novel um, I completed in, um, in three months. And um, Penguin Publishers heard about it and wrote to me and, and said, look, um, all your colleagues have been talking about this, um, this wonderful book that you're writing. Because at the time I was living in a little shack and uh, I would write and I would give like a couple of pages to these writer friends of mine and they would read it and, and not critique it really heavily but say, that is really fantastic, you know, and, and gave it back to me and then I would go back and, and start writing again. And so when I finished it <coughs> and I got this letter um, and so I um, accepted the invitation to have lunch and this is the first time I went into a restaurant and... Uh, they said, order anything you want. <laughs> so I had wine and I had, you know, fish and <laughs> I had, you know, this, this was, was fantastic. And, 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 um, and I had a, a, a box with me with the manuscript inside it. So the editor took it away and about uh, two weeks later he, um, he wrote to me and then he rang me up and he said, we love it. It is a great book and we think it's going to um, do really well but there are a few things that um, we would like to sit down and discuss with you regarding the book and, and I, kind of, I, I asked them what is it and they said well for a start you're going to have to put in all the full stops all the uh, capital letters <laughs> all the commas because <laughs> I just wrote it as, a, as one um, lump of uh, text and so <clears throat> I had to sit down with this really good friend of mine who is a professor of English, uh, a very great professor of English in New Zealand, and we spent a whole year um, sitting in front of his computer where I would be sitting here and he'll be sitting there in front of the, the machine and I'll be reading. And as I'm reading and I pause, he would be sitting there going, is that a comma? Uh, I'm gonna, I go, oh, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure. And he goes, maybe we'll just put a semicolon. <laughs> and, and that's how we kind of uh, fixed the book up because basically it was to be published for people to read and, um, and obviously um, we didn't want people, you know, getting really confused about reading a book. Um, so I, I learned a lot from that, from that um, process as, as a poet and as a writer in, in, in how to um, do things for, for people to read and to enjoy. But I don't necessarily um, go all the way and compromise. There are uh, a big part of me that do not like to kind of um, give too much, you know, um, kind of things away. I like to keep a few things to myself. So when, when the book came out, it was, um, it, you know, I had a, a, a really good time with it. But I thought I'll tell you that story because um, um, it was... It was one of um, three novels that I wrote as, a, as part of that trilogy. And the second novel that came out was Burn My Head in Heaven, and that's where this um, text that you see here came out of. And it's basically a very simple story of a, a girl getting her ears pierced and the, and the community's involvement in celebrating that piercing by, um, by um, all my aunties kind of getting together and organising different dance groups and um, creating new songs, uh, creating new things to wear. And I don't know if, you, if you've ever been to, <coughs> to a Pacific um, Island dance um, extravaganza where you've got all the aunties dancing. There is a lot of talcum powder being, you know, sprinkled everywhere. Floors all covered and, you know, it's just dusty in, 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 in the hall and there's Macintosh lollies, you know, spread all over the floor, um, there's perfumes, it's, it's quite an extraordinary experience, um, you know, to, to be in a room full of, um, f full of uh, New Wayne aunties and dancers, because this is part of the, the building up of, and also it's part of, um, of um, preparing, you know, people for the incredible dance that, that is about to kind of uh, take place. And so what I try to do in, these, in this text, piece of text here was try and create that feeling of, um, of uh, bird life, um, oceanic life, uh, fragrances, perfumes, lollies, all these things that are kind of uh, associated with, 
with um, celebrating this girl's um, ear piercing. And her role is, you know, pretty, you know, um, easy. She just kind of sits there wrapped up in an incredible layer of all sorts of different um, materials, very colourful materials, and it all comes all the way up to here. And it's just so thick that she kind of can't move. Um, and while she's sitting there, everybody is kind of uh, celebrating all around her. But, um, but as usual, with good stories, there are always, you know, something sinister going on. Um, it's based on a true story, um, and so I kind of depicted my uncles as the drunken blokes, you know, <laughs> kind of at the party and, you know, kind of getting overexcited. And so um, the first thing, um, you know, that happens when islanders get into a fight, you know, the police come around in force. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I try and um, depict that as well because that was the kind of reality of the situation um, in those days. Um, but it does not take away from the from the beauty of, of these dances. Um, a lot of the songs that I kind of created um, with, um, in, in, in the, the text here that the dancers um, were singing are songs that kind of uh, looked back to Niue and also uh, looked forward into their new life um, in New Zealand. We've got a, quite a few famous songs written by people in, in Niue um, thanking the, the New Zealand government for being so nice to us. Um, so I try to kind of uh, bring that aspect into it too, and also the hardship and also the, you know, the, the things that they had to kind of deal with. Um, I'm also inter interested in, in, the, um, in the geography and the layout of, of, the, of the area that, um, that uh, my people lived in, and especially where I lived in. So, for example, in my first book, um, uh, you're sitting on the bus and you're travelling from the city and it takes about an hour and a half to get to, to where I lived in Otara. And so I give a very detailed account of the, of the route the bus is taken until it gets to uh, my bus stop. And then I give a, a description of uh, the things around there and also I give a really uh, detailed description of, of what my house looked like once I step inside. And so, so the reader would, would, um, would get the sense that um, they are you know, kind of walking with me and once they get into my house and I describe what uh, the interior looks like, they will not be lost. Yeah. But these state houses uh, were uh, designed by the same probably the same architect because they all look the same. And so when you walk inside, you know, it's all the same thing. You turn left and go up 25 stairs, you know, toilets over here, bedrooms. <laughs> so you won't get lost in these things. But um, I'm very interested in, uh, in how I can use um, the English language in that way um, is, is to give um, very detailed and, and clear descriptions of the kind of things that I'm, I'm walking around and things like that. Have anybody got any question? <laughs> okay. Oh, here we go. You had talked, Susan. Okay. You had talked about the meaning of red in these yeah. paintings, and um, seeing the exhibition catalog from your new work, which has clouds and vines, but they're green. I'm curious what the change in meaning is, or just what that meaning is for it to be green, even though they're not up here. That's yeah. it. Okay. <clears throat> what Susan is uh, talking about is that I've just had a, um, a solo exhibition in Auckland where um, all the paintings in the show were green. Um, it looks like this, but uh, this is red and black, and, and these, new pa these other paintings are green and black. So the only difference is, is that you're looking at um, green. Um, green, you want to know why I used green? Okay, well, um, <coughs> green. Um, I've got green shoes on. It's one of, I was going to wear my green shirt today, but I thought I'd better not <laughs> because I knew something like this was about to happen. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Um, that's um, green. I've, well, I've, I've used. Well, you can see this green way at the end there. That's uh, a zap green, and that's my favorite green. I don't know why it's called a zap green. Maybe because it 
it's quite a shiny type of green. But that's my ferret green, and, and that's the green that Susan is referring to. But, uh, but I'm using mostly kind of uh, more kind of <clears throat> enamel green. Um, and green, what I tried to do in those paintings, Susan, was to try and create a forest. And also, um, I stole the title from uh, a Brian Eno album called um, Another Green World. And um, in that album, he imagined that these were the type of music that he wanted to hear at airports in the future. So, so I thought that maybe he was um, referring to um, some form of uh, utopia or another world where um, instead of getting hassled at airports, you know, you'd be able to kind of, you know, go in there without any too much hassle. Um, but it also refers, so when you go into New Zealand, the first thing you see in New Zealand when you get there is the kia ora sign, you know, saying welcome. <laughs> and that is a very um, powerful statement to kind of make because um, we still don't have that rigid, you know, militaristic kind of um, um, <clears throat> welcome, <clears throat> you know, into the country yet. So, um, and green is also, um, you know, the, the symbol and, and, and the and the power of, of um, other countries as well and, you know, that are, are being ravaged by, by war and, and, and things like that. So that's why I use the green. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um. <clears throat> so, so is there any, any other questions and maybe um, a few more, two more questions and then we can, um, can stop. Mm. Hello. The, the drawings? Yes, that is um, from uh, a chapter in the second novel. It's just one chapter. Mm. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. Mm. Wow. <laughs> mm. Yes. Yes. Um. I was. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, I wasn't thinking of that. But thanks for for. Um, this lady has just asked that for those that can't hear the number yeah. fourteen that it seems to be prominent in John's mm. work. But it's an insight to John. Is that yeah. right? Hmm. It's an insight to you. I, 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 you know, um, no, I didn't know. I didn't know why I did 14. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I, 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 I started off writing it in English, and then um, kind of like the eight, uh, late 80s, I started translating um, uh, my poems into, into the New Wayne language onto canvas. But I don't know if you were in this other talk, I, I was part of the other day um, when I had my first exhibition of word paintings, um, all my aunties kind of turned up and told me what was wrong with them. And, and I spelt this one wrong and I spelt this wrong and I wasn't allowed to use this word because it, it wasn't the right word to use, you know. Um, and so late that night I, I went back in with, with my brushes and, and you know, paints and corrected it all, but it was really difficult. But I, I, I learned a lot from that because you can't just go in there and rub out oil, you know, um, because it kind of gives it a different um, feeling afterwards. But um, but translating them into into um, New Wayne um, for me, it, it gives it, um, you know, it's because um, what we were talking about, you know, um, why and how we translate things, you know. Um, and suppose when when I use the New Wayne language, it's it's part of that a whole idea about um, what you do with something that you've learnt from, from somewhere else, you know, and how you kind of uh, translate it and, um, and do the right thing, yeah, with it. So, um, <coughs> hmm.
Oh. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a hard one. <laughs> it's hard to That's talk. That's an essay. Um, um, oh, before we finish, um, I did something um, which I, I regret now. Um, in my first novel, I, I, was, I, I, I was very direct and I told the truth about all the, all the people that were mean to me growing up. Um, and I got phone calls left, right and centre from all sorts of people ringing me up and telling me off and, you know, almost cursing me over the phone about why I described their father for and all their mother, you know. And, um, and one day in church, um, an auntie of mine stood up in front of the congregation and waved my, my novel in the air. And my mum was sitting in, the, in front and this auntie of mine was damning the novel. And, and mentioning my mum's name and my name. So my mother was very, very hurt and um, very embarrassed by, by that situation. And uh, she never went back to church again. <clears throat> and um, so after that, she was very suspicious when I asked her, hey, can you tell me what happened in 1961? <laughs> she goes, I'm not saying anything to you ever again. <laughs> um, because my mother and my auntie, um, you know, gave me all these incredible stories, you know, which helped me write my book. But I also wanted to get back at these people who, you know, who, who, were, who were quite mean to me as a child. And the next one thing I'll, I'll probably um, try not to do again is to describe people accurately, you know, because when people read your book, they go, hey, <laughs> I know that person. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. For your time. Please join Thank me you in more. thanking John Pulley for his okay. insights.